The DC stuff is very new to you, um, and unlike a lot of the AC, EEG, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma stuff that you've got some familiarity with, this, uh, the DC stuff was very, very different um, since it's primarily a European training technique for slow cortical potentials. However, uh, given the modern equipment that's out in the U.S. at this point, DC training is happening in uh, the new BrainMaster. Atlantis has a DC uh, 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 variety of that amp coming out and software to do feedback. Uh, the Thought Technology amp uh, goes down very close to DC, their, their brand new amp, it's functionally equivalent. Um, the the uh, amps coming out of Europe uh, obviously are, are all, like the Nexus and some of those, are all DC sensitive amps. So the, the therapists in the United States are getting equipment that can do it um, at, at this point. And, and uh, in the United States, DC or slow cortical potential training is happening now. So uh, it's not just in Europe, it's not just the Germans doing this. Uh, uh, it's happening in the US and, and uh, uh, throughout Europe as, as well. Um, the importance of the DC system is that in order to understand brain function, you really need to understand this basic on-off DC system as well as the AC EEG that we've been looking at historically here in the US, filtering out the slow cortical stuff. And then to really understand how the mind and brain and consciousness work, you can't filter out the slow stuff and only look at the EEG. You can't filter out the EEG and only look at the slow stuff because it's those systems working together that allow us to understand how the brain and mind and consciousness are working. I've mentioned earlier the fact that intention to move is a frontal phenomenon. In neurophysiology, it's called the Bereitschaft's potential. It's a very long German word. <laughs> uh, it essentially means that you're intending to move. And so it's the slow cortical potential associated with intention to move. It's the same exact phenomenon in the somatosensory and visual and auditory areas, but instead of motor intention, it's the intention to perceive that we call attention. So intention and attention are the same exact thing. It's DC electronegative intention to move, or the lack of intention to move, the DC positive. And sensorily, um, in the sensory areas, it's the intention to perceive or attention. Um, motivation is the same basic thing, only it's um, in the uh, frontal areas. Um, and uh, uh, that uh, is also uh, an important phenomenon. Now, all of these things are neuropsych type functions that we would typically ascribe to the mind. Um, and in the model you're about to hear, the mind is glial. What we think of as the brain is neural. And when those two systems interact, the emergent property is consciousness. Now we're going to look at that in a lot more depth, but that's the model in a sentence. Well, a couple sentences. But it's shrunken down into a digestible you know, entity. The mind is glial, what we think of as the brain is neural, and when those two systems interact, consciousness happens. So let's look at that and uh, take a peek at it here. We're going to try to explain a whole bunch of things by showing what they look like neurophysiologically. Um, we're going to talk about memory, Intention, attention, perception. Perception is going to include awareness, discrimination, conscious awareness, and we're also going to have to be able to predict objectively whether the brain is consciously aware or not. And we're going to have to explain things like binding, the spatially divergent areas in the brain, if we're going to perceive something and then move with respect to it, we have to end up perceiving, but then our motion ends up having to have the neural networks that are involved in regulation of motion all locked together 
momentarily to move. Uh, that locking together includes the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, the frontal areas, and the motor cortex. That network has to bind together to function temporarily. So the model is going to have to explain binding of these divergent areas. And not only is it going to have to explain consciousness, but we know that we really have to have a dual consciousness in the brain because we have two hemispheres. And we know if we cut the two of them apart, you literally have two conscious entities that are pretty darn separate uh, happening inside of your head. If you've ever looked at the split brain studies, it's really quite astounding. The two hemispheres will fight for control. The left hand will grab the right hand, put it aside, and try to do the task. So you, you literally are going to have to explain consciousness and have to remember, uh, based on Joe Bogan's work, you know, notice I didn't say Sperry. Sperry got the Nobel Prize for a split brain, but he learned everything he needed to know from Joe Bogan, a neurosurgeon uh, at Caltech in uh, L.A. Joe died recently. He was an old friend. So, um, and not only that, but it should be digestible and understandable by a lay person. An educated lay person should be able to understand this model. You shouldn't have to have specialized education and specialized knowledge in order to understand the model and how it works. And that criteria was um, uh, uh, f from uh, Welder Penfield's um, book in 1972, I believe is the date of the book, called Mysteries of the Mind. And in that, he basically said, if you come up with a model of how it works, it has to be understandable to the uh, an educated lay person.